All right, let's talk about complexity. Think about something really challenging to draw, like a bouquet with a hundred flowers in it, or a pile of people, or a portrait where the person has this insane wavy hair that's pinned up in a weird way and you don't even know where to begin with that. In this video, I want to show you how if you understand the principles of drawing, it doesn't matter what it is you're drawing and how complex it is because you can follow a certain step-by-step -step regimen to get to your answer. So I will be going with hair and walk you through how these principles of drawing can help you not just draw a simple head of hair, but even the most complex complicated looking versions of hair. And the good news is that whatever we'll be talking about with hair, it's going to be applicable for any of those other subject matters that are complex and confusing as well. So through this lesson, you'll see me do three drawings. One, just a simple strand of hair, like one curl, and how do you get that to look well? And then we'll do a more simple hairstyle and then a very complex hairstyle. And you'll see how the process is always the same and how if you follow the right phases and ask the right questions, how that will become the key to unlocking anything that seems really, really complex. So let's dive into it. The crucial shift that has to happen is that we shift away from what it is that we're trying to draw and we shift towards how it is we should be drawing it. So instead of thinking figures, trees, owls, and portrait with a lot of hair, think in terms of what's the gesture of it. So usually gesture is figure drawing related, but even hair has a gesture like this in pink and sub gestures like this in green. Begin there, then shift towards thinking about what is the shape. So shape can be the overall silhouette like this, or it can be the smaller sub shapes that are within the silhouette. Once you have considered those two things, you wanna think about the form. Where are the major plane changes from the top to the side, from the front to the side? And that can be described simply with cross contour lines and plane changes. And once you have that, assigning value will become much easier. So um, value considers things like what are the shadow patterns? Like here you see enclosed in red, all the shadow patterns. It will consider things like gradations and form modeling. And then it will also consider things like um, local value. Like how dark is the pigment on the left hair compared to the middle hair compared to the right set of hairs. And this is going to be the sequence through which you consider your subject matter through. So the sequence always stays the same. And notice how at the very end of the sequence is texture. Is the hair shiny like here? Or is the hair more frizzy and curly like in this example? But those are considerations that you can only get to if you've already answered what is above in the sequence. So is it tousled and a little bit dull looking or is it very shiny and very curly? Again, those are the things that stand out to us um, right away up front, which is usually why we wanna address them first, but we have to bide our time. So your key is the how in the sequence, not getting freaked out by the what. So let's put this into practice. Here is what it would look like to consider the gesture as your first step of the drawing. You want to visually connect the parts into an entirety. So how can you connect the back of the head to the rest of the hair with one big C swoop, for example? And what are the other smaller sub swoops within this hair arrangement? That is the gesture. Anything in life has a gesture. It's not just a figure drawing related element. Once you have that captured, you go to the next part in your sequence, which is this shape element. So that can be the silhouette of the hairdo, like the biggest outer shape, or it can be the sub shapes, the smaller shapes within that big silhouette. And notice how my lines differ from the gesture to the shape phase. I use straighter angles for the shape phase and I use more organic curvy lines when I was doing the gesture phase. 
Now, once I have that, I can push myself into the third phase of the drawing, which is considering the form. So form is three-dimensionality. How do things overlap each other, like different hair strands? And also, what is the underlying form? So in this case, we have a spherical head that is being lit on certain parts and not on other parts. So that is going to be the light logic informing how we apply value. So as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, value has three elements. What is shadow and what is light? What are gradations? And what is the overall pigmentation, the overall local value? So what you're seeing me draw in this part of the video is the shadow pattern. Now you might be saying, well, wait a minute, you're just drawing lines. Like how does this have anything to do with the value? Here's the thing. The first step in, in, in mapping out your values is shadow mapping. So again, as I said, it's, it's finding the edges of where the light doesn't reach anymore and the shadows begin. So I'm not shading yet. I'm beginning with the edges of the shadow pattern. And that is logical based on the underlying form and how the light is situated in relation to our underlying form. And in our case with, with the head, the underlying form is basically a ball. And so if you understand how light behaves on a ball, then you can figure out how light should behave on a head, even though it's sometimes not as apparent. But here you can see me draw in with a green line where the light doesn't reach anymore. And that can be simple, but it can also be really complex. So again, um, the answers depend on where on the complexity scale your subject matter lies. Is it just sleek hair falling over this ovoid? Or is there more to it? But the how doesn't change. Just what looks like a very simple pattern for a sleek hair becomes more complicated when the hair is curly. And as you're plotting out your shadow patterns, you wanna make sure you have both the cast shadow like here and also the form shadow edges. So the cast shadow edges are the edges of the shadow that exist because something is blocking the light. And the form shadow edges exist because the form underneath is turning away. So the top of the head becoming the side of the head is a form shadow edge. And the cast shadow edge is the head blocking the light from reaching the top of the shoulder. So ironically, the first stage of getting your value fully established has nothing to do with value. It really has more to do with understanding a pattern and understanding how you create a good pattern on a piece of paper. So meaning we're not just creating these kind of wishy-washy um, smudges that we don't really know when they start and when they end, but that you have a really well enclosed shape for the shadows. So notice how I'm shading it in. I'm not varying at this point the difference between um, how light or dark certain zones are. I'm just putting in one flat tone for the shadow pattern. And this is also the same way of applying tone or shading for establishing the local color or the local value. So if you look at this example, here are three types of local color for hair. And when you build that element of the value, you want to apply it in what's called no tan. So in a flat way. So just going one directional, you're not interested in building a gradation from light to dark. The only time when you work on building a gradation from light to dark is when you're addressing the form modeling element of the drawing process. So right here, I'm building the gradation, the transition from the left side of the head to the top of the head. It's a soft, rounded transition, which becomes a softer, rounded gradation. 
and how you treat the edges of your shadow shapes will affect how we read the texture. So a very clean shadow shape will read sleek and slick. And then a more fuzzy edge on a shadow shape will look like it's a more dull hair or a more textured hair. So the way you treat the edges of your shadow shapes will affect how we read the texture. So you see how you cannot just jump into a texture if you don't have any good shadow shapes. Once I have my shadow pattern masked in with a darker value, I gradate or transition into the light mass. And that is another place where you can start to indicate the texture of the hair. So I'm dealing with each hair section as its own little segment. Every hair segment has a shadow side and a light side, and I'll gradate into that light, and I will look at which direction is the hair flowing, and uh, how separated is it, and so this is the only time I'll actually make marks that kind of seem like hair. I'm not drawing individual hairs, I'm just giving the feeling of hair in the mid-tone areas, which are the darker areas of the light. If I need to, I will always come back and tie everything back together by shading the shadow pattern in another pass. Again, it simplifies the shadow pattern and draws the, the, the eye towards the light and where you have the detail. And just how I'm paying attention to the edges of the shadow shapes, I'm also paying attention to the outer edges, to the silhouette edges of the hair, because the cleaner those are, the more it'll translate that texture of slick, shiny hair. So let's look at a more complex example where we're going through the same exact process. First, we begin with our gesture. And after we have the gesture in our organic manner, we switch into the shapes. So for that, we mean the big enveloping shape, but also the smaller shapes, like the sections of the hair. And then within the sections of the hair, the shadow patterns in each hair section. So when I say shapes, it's not just the outer shapes, it's also the subshapes, and then the shadow shapes on the subshapes. Once I have those, then I deal with the edges of the shadow shapes. Where are my forms transitioning into shadow? I will gradate those. And where are their cast shadow edges? So every little strand of hair that's counting as a clump has its own form. And every own form has a form shadow edge, which has to get gradated, and then we'll have a little bit of a cast shadow. So the more tousled hair is, the more it clumps together in sections, the more you want to think of every section as a little form made out of clay that has to have its own form shadow and also casts a shadow onto whatever is next to it. Let me break it down for you in an example of just a single strand of hair. Gesture first, how do you want it to flow? Then you turn this kind of flowy, organic, linear drawing into a shape drawing. And you've got to be clear about which section of the curl overlaps the next. So being clear about where the twist is, where you need this overlap, that is going to be a key piece of information. And the more you use those straight angles, the more structured your hair is going to look. Now I'm applying local value. This is a very light colored hair. I'm just giving it some overall tone. That's the local value applied in a no tan manner. Now I'm thinking about the lighting. Let's say the light's coming from the top, a little bit from the top right. Somewhere right around here, that's where the form won't be reached by the light anymore. So I'm making this up, I'm just giving my best guesstimation of how this form would behave. So this part of the hair wouldn't be reached by the light quite as much as the other parts of the hair because of the angle it has relative to the light. So if um, you want to think of it as a paper strip that's bent a certain way, these X 
parts of the paper strip, they're being reached by the light. And all the other paper strip bendy pieces that are angled away don't get the light. So we call those the shadow masses. So that's what I was plotting out earlier um, with the shadow edges and the shadow pattern. And here that transition from the shadow into the light plane, that's your form shadow edge. That's where you gradate. That's where you put the texture indications. And you can do the same thing on the cast shadow edge side. So any edges are your prime real estate for indicating what type of hair that it is that you're dealing with. And that is true for the shadow edges, but it's also true for the outer edges of the hair lock. So this is where you also really want to have a super pointy pencil because if you have a dull pencil getting those fine looking strands is going to be a challenge so always resharpen as you go and you can also erase into these kind of mid-tone places to get those lighter strands of hair as well so here i'm pulling some single hairs uh, to break open that outer shape of the hair here at the tips of the lock that's a perfect place to indicate your texture saying hey this is actually made up out of individual hairs you don't want to put that effort into zones where you're wasting your your work so know where to place your texture and save yourself and as i'm putting accents into this strand of hair i'm always reevaluating if they're starting to compete with the light logic that i'm setting up because the logic should be that anything that's in the shadow side still needs to be darker than anything that's in the light mass side. So you will frequently have to reshade over your shadow masses just to reestablish them so that the accents within the midtones don't start to compete. So let's come back to this more complex version and finish this out. One thing I want you to understand that the more complex your subject matter is, the process doesn't change. I will always go in the order that I've explained to you so far. The only thing that will change is the focus and the time investment. And with that, also the patience. So when I come to a little section of the bun that's kind of tucked in the back, like right here, I'm still thinking, okay, how is this turning? And which part of this little section hidden, tucked away in that bun is actually being reached by light? And how much is it transitioning out of the light into the shadow? And do I need to put another layer of local value over this? So maintain the order that you're addressing the fundamental principles and also make sure that you bring with you the accurate amount of patience, the accurate amount of time, and the accurate amount of commitment. You cannot approach a complex subject matter like this with the attitude of, oh, I quick, quick have to get it done, and let me just, you know, rush through this. Complexity costs you something. It costs you time, it costs you effort, it costs you fo focus, and it costs you organization. And if you're unwilling to spend that, then don't be surprised if the drawing doesn't come together and if you are starting to get flustered easily. So I think that's really relieving because once you understand, okay, if I do want to have like this really curly frizzy hair and I want to render it out, I don't just want to put a flat tone on it and call it done. I actually want the texture to, to translate. I need to make sure I have enough time allotted for it. I need to make sure I have my tools constantly sharp. I need to make sure that I have a plan of which section I'm going to tackle first and which section I'm going to tackle next. And the other relief to me is that you don't have to put the same amount of complexity everywhere. That there are certain zones like the shadow zones where you can just keep the drawing fairly flat. And as long as I put the attention and bring my focus and patience into the 
correct areas, I'll be fine. So I'm going to slow this down in just a second to show you which are those correct areas. So any time we have a edge again, so that would be a shadow edge, and that can be a form or cast shadow. And it can also be a transition edge where you transition from your um, shadow into the midtone or from the midtone into the highlight. So those are those areas of highest interest where we do want to have that razor sharp pencil, where we do want to slow down the speed with which we work and where we just want to bring that extra time to it and, and not feel like we have to rush through this, but like really settle in and get into this meditative state of just going slow. And I wanted to show you one last thing. Here's where you might want to have one of those pen erasers and you take a razor blade and if you cut it at an angle, you get the super sharp edge on your eraser. And then you can use that to erase these very small highlights out that might be a little bit trickier to get in, in any other way with the needed erasers because they're often a little bit too soft and, and malleable. So I just want to make sure you have this little trick up your sleeve as well as you tackle your next hair drawings. So I have taught people for years and years how to master drawing. And when we got focused on drawing the thing, whether it's the portrait, the figure, the animal, or the hair, it would overwhelm people. But as soon as we made that switch into focusing on the how and really mastering, okay, what is a gesture and how do I create good shapes and therefore good proportions? And how do I understand form and inform my drawings with that understanding? That's when the growth really came together. So you see how that all works now? The important part is that you remember your key. Don't get stuck on asking, what is it I'm trying to draw? Oh my God, it's hair. It's so complex. Don't worry about the what. Focus on the how. Focus on these principles and how the order is that you want to um, consider them in, and it will lead you to your goal. I hope you found this useful. If you did, give me a thumbs up, follow this channel, and if you want to take this further, feel free to look in the description below because like that you can find out how to work with me on a one-to-one -one basis. And I would love to talk to you about your drawing goals too. Take care.